Um, so we're, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Koenigsoff from the University of Colorado in Denver. Uh, and she will be talking to us about what cells in the IPF lung are senescent, which we touched on a little bit. Thank you very much, Anoop, and I would also um, thank in general you and Joe and everybody from the PF Foundation of inviting me to contribute to this session, and it's actually my first PFF summit, so I am very glad to be here and to see the, see the excitement and the hope, actually, in this community. So this is really inspiring, and I hope I can, you know, I contribute a little bit to that as well today. So really, the title that you see from my talk, what was given to me by the organizers, directly touches upon the question we just had in the previous discussion, what cells are really the ones that are senescent in IPF lung, and does it really matter actually what kind of cells are senescent within the lung? And I hope I can convince you and convey the message that I do believe there are senescent cells in the IPF lung, and also that we have data supporting that it matter what kind of cells we are looking at. All right, so first of all, you know, like, why does cellular senescence matter? And I just have a very few slides on this because my previous speaker in the session already very nicely alluded to this and how important really cellular senescence is. So you all by now are aware that we believe that IPF is an age-related disease, and we not only believe this, but really the data showing us that with increasing age, also the incidence of the diseases is on the rise. If you think about what else really challenges our lung next to aging and just by living actually and aging, we de definitely also have to take into account our genes and the environment. So we often talk as IPF as a gene environment disease and obviously aging also as an important factor to consider in these aspects. And this is really something that has come up in more recent years, not only because we got more data on this, but also we were able to really study this. And I think this was something that also already within the keynote uh, lectures in the morning, we've heard that really we have come a long way because now we have technologies at hand and methodologies at hand where we can really um, study these different mechanisms in more detail. So if you're thinking about aging and about the different hallmarks of aging, again, like they are actually very nicely shown in this graph. I hope you can see this on the left-hand side, where you can see all the different hallmarks of aging. And really, the one thing that we all focus on today within the session is the one thing that, which is called cellular senescence, which is in this greenish bubble in the upper left side, which I hope you can see. And just to remind you what cellular senescence really means is that a cell actually diverts from its normal business, if you so want, from its normal function and goes into permanent cell cycle arrest. So this is how we define senescence. That can then, in the context of a disease process, primarily lead to a chronic accumulation of these cells. So they're sticking around, I think is what Nick said just previously, and they are not cleared what they should normally uh, be done with. And if you look at this in a little bit more of a schematic way and how this is coming across the uh, age or the, the life actually together is that we A, have to understand what really triggers senescence. And on the left-hand side, you see there's a lot of many different triggers that we know, but there's also a lot of triggers that we don't know. And also what is, I think, important is that at the moment, even if we're talking about something like IPF, we don't really know if there's a specific inducer or if it's just an accumulation of all these different things. But I hope you can see that with things on the left-hand side, like telomere dysfunction, which we just heard in the morning, like oxidative stress, there are things that are very, very common in IPF. So we can also think that there is a, much of a reason to develop senescent cells within the lung. Then if you look at the short-term versus long-term consequences, I think this is important, and this is what we all try to understand better. What is really normal aging or normal senescence versus what is the disease-specific senescence we are talking about? Because senescence has also good ways, it has a good reason, actually, that we have senescent cells within the body. So normally they are for tumor suppressive mechanism, but then these cells are also cleared. So really the challenge that we have with an IPF lung and in other chronic lung diseases is that these cells stick around, they accumulate, and we have to understand what is their function a little bit better. And one thing is not only that these cells are not have they cell autonomous regular functions anymore, but also that they really secrete a lot of different factors, proteins, mediators out of uh, the cell, and that means that they're talking constantly to the microenvironment, to other cell types, and so by that obviously influencing how an organ on a you know, like complete organ level actually can function. 
So really, I think this is why senescence matters. So because it changes our cellular phenotype, it changes how a cell can react to injury. And also it secretes a lot of different factors that then again, like in the scheme, very simplified shows, can have a lot of effects not only on the cell itself, but also on other cell types. So what does it really mean for the lung? And what do we really need to understand if senescence contribute to what we observe in IPF? In IPF, we have this as a classical histology, I think many in the room are aware of. We don't have proper repair and healing. We have a really you know, like very confused organ, if you so want. So we want to know what really cellular senescence does, with, does contribute to this. And I give you one example of you know, like how you can think about an organ or a lung really functions. And I like to think about that like how a car works. Uh, I like BMW, as you can hear. Maybe I'm a German accent, so I'm... Uh, I'm a big fan of this car, and you can see just by looking at these different cars, they are all different, there are many different cars, there's a different pavement, but there's also different models. And you see the second to right, this is a very old one. And there are many different old ones. So aging, obviously, or age in general, has a huge effect and can change the capacity of a cell to, to really go um, for repair. So what cells are senescent in the IPF lung? Um, to this, I would really like to actually focus my attention on a cell which we have heard a little bit about uh, in the morning session already. It's really where we believe a lot of the constant injury and repair mechanisms are happening within an IPF lung, and this is within the lung epithelium. And then we have this huge passive mechanism, which is very simplified here, which definitely leads then to lung fibrosis. But really, I want to focus and hopefully convince you that also within the lung epithelium, this is where a lot of the senescence um, is um, at work, if you so want. And this comes by basic observation that you know, like these cells, these lung epithelial cells, are really have many, many different phenotype. We call it the frustrated epithelial cell in IPF that really tries to survive, tries to repair. And one of the many, many different phenotypes that we see is epithelial cell senescence. And why does this matter? So it matters because it's in, within the lung epithelium, and you don't have to understand all the different acronyms or anything within here. It's really that you know, just need to know that there are arrows in between the different cells, meaning that some of these cells work as progenitor cells for others. So within the lung epithelium, we have a number of different progenitor cells, which are important for renewal and constant homeostasis within the lung. So you could easily imagine if you have a defect and a senescent cell was in here that this also affects the stem cell renewal and by that also the homeostasis and repair capacity. So how do we measure senescence? Just very quickly, because I will show you a couple of slides to this. There are several ways of how you can look at senescence markers. Oops, sorry. Some of these are uh, um, P16, P21, which are intracellular markers that we look at, uh, which mark a cellular senescence pathway. And then also in the red circle here is a beta-galactosidase staining. So this is actually an enzyme which is specifically expressed within a senescent cell. And then the SASP, so what the cell secrete, has been already mentioned. So these are the ways of how at the moment we can look at this. And one of the things that we can do in any kind of different diseases, and which we did for years and years and decades even, is to really look at histology slides. Because within the histology, we see the whole lung, we see all the different cell types. And this is just an example from our own work, where we looked specifically for P21, P16, so very specific cellular senescence markers. And we actually could show that there are primarily in areas where we have epithelial cells. So these are epithelial cell markers that are co-stained there, surfactant, protein C, and keratin-5. And also other groups have shown similar things by really looking specifically on epithelial cells from an IPF patients that we can see within these type 2 cells, within these lung epithelial cells, an increase of beta-galactosidase, this enzyme, which you can see here on the right-hand side. And this is just another way of measuring this by flow cytometry. But both data sets actually show you that within the IPF lung, within the human tissue specimen, we find senescent cells within the epithelium. We also looked at this in the mouse model, and I just want to mention this quickly because we still always try to you know, use experimental models, obviously, to not only verify, but also further elucidate the mechanism of cellular senescence. And I hope you can see here on the left-hand side that if we isolate even again like our lung epithelial cells out of, the, out of a fibrotic mouse lung, we also see increases in senescence, as you can see here nicely with the blue cells 
on the left-hand side. We also looked at what these cells secrete. It has been mentioned that this is something of real huge interest also for biomarker development because these cells secrete something which is related to senescence. And when we looked on an unbiased proteomics approach, really on the secretome of these fibrotic epithelial cells, you can see that within the secretome of these fibrotic cells are specific markers that we know are related to a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. So all these data are really much pointing in the direction that we do indeed have um, a huge increase in cellular senescence specifically, or at least enriched in the lung epithelium. So what about other cells? Other cells have been mentioned in the previous discussion, and obviously there are a lot of other cell types also within the lung. So when we looked into the mouse lung, we, def we, we actually um, saw that we have an enrichment in Epithelial cells, again, we compared it to fibroblasts, which is the middle part, and I know that you, know, you can't really see the numbers, but if you just look at the shape of the curve, you can, where we looked at is actually if we find senescent gene signature within a specific cell type. And I hope you can see just by looking basically on the gene enrichment analysis here that we do see a very strong enrichment in epithelial cell. Not much of a so strong enrichment in the fibroblast, but at least there is a little bit. And there is a couple of data also that was, has been mentioned before that f also fibroblast within the IPF lung gets fibrotic. I get senescent, sorry. <laughs> and you can see this on the right hand histology over there, which is zoomed in, which is from Victor Senecal's group, where you can see that you have senescence in the epithelial cell as well as in the fibroblast. And there have been other elegant work also by Corey, actually, who is also giving a talk after me today, showing that indeed also fibroblasts in IPF cells get senescent and that changes their behavior and change how we can target them for, for therapies. So, but really, this is something where we looked very specifically on very specific cell types for the longest time. And I want to actually, like, follow along the keynote lecture in the morning given by Naftali and talk a little bit about single cell analysis because really that has changed the field a lot, I would say, over the past couple of years. And it gives us the unbiased opportunity to really look into all different kind of cell types within the, within the lung. So basically, the very first single cell analysis of the human IPF lung done by the Northwestern Group, which is published in the blue paper, already specifically also looked at senescence scores and again like looked like and tried to find a senescence phenotype. And even in these data set also here, and I hope you can see it over with the slides, is that there is more senescence found in an IPF lung specifically if you look on an epithelial cell. And what is interesting then is not only what cells matter, because at one point, now looking deeper and deeper into different cell types, is what cell subpopulation and how different are these. And I think the message that I would like to bring across is that we can find in an unbiased way that we do have specifically, again, a senescence phenotype in the epithelial cells, but also that there are different subtypes within the epithelial cells that are important. And again, other single cell data are coming up at the moment by the minute. These are two bioarchive papers from the Vanderbilt group and from the Yale group, which we have heard about already. And I just want to highlight again that within this data set, where we really clearly see that there is an epithelial cell signature, we also do see cellular senescence. And this is the last piece also out of single cell data, which I really found powerful. Again, these are data which are not yet published, but preprint at the moment available from Barry Strips Group at CEDARS, where they looked at epithelial cell enriched cells actually from the IPF lung, and again found specifically that within these cell types, they have a huge enrichment in these senescence associated proteins and in these senescence markers. So really all of things points to a direction from bias, if you so want, as well as unbiased approaches that we do find specifically epithelial cells within the IPF lung to be senescent. And just one mention to ongoing studies in this direction, what we actually still don't understand in this area, and which I mentioned at the very beginning quickly, was we don't know what is really inducing senescence within our lungs. Obviously, there are these common triggers that accumulate over the age and over the years, but also very um, specific markers that we know, or pathways that we know for the longest time that have been implicated in IPF are now coming up and showing that they also can further promote this phenotype. Here's one example for TGF-beta. On the left-hand side, where you can see that TGF-beta on epithelial cells induces classical markers of 
cellular senescence, as well as on the right-hand side, similar things have, are shown for wind beta catenin signaling, which also can promote if it's chronically applied to a cellular senescence phenotype. So this is a very tight interlink, actually, between cellular senescence as well as the pro-fibrotic factors, and this is something that I think we need to understand a little bit more in detail. So, and with this, actually, the consequences of lung epicsis, in essence, and this is my last data slide, is really to come back to what also Nick has been mentioned about progenitor cell function. So, if you think about that in lung epicsis cells, where we do have a lot of progenitor cells, is senescence, it maybe cannot really work anymore in terms of what their proper function is. And one way to look for progenitor cell function is to look into these organoid assays, which really have come up lately, where we try out of a single cell to generate cell proliferation and differentiation. And I just give you one example, and basically what you can see, there are nice circles and balls, I hope, but the main message actually, what, what is important for this is that within the senescent cells, we do have a reduction of a capacity to really have stem cell function. So this all points into the direction that we do have, you know, like uh, within the senescent cells, um, that this contribute to impaired tissue repair. All right, so let me summarize this at the very end. So why does it matter which cells are senescent? I hope I could show you that cellular senescence results most likely an impaired tissue repair capacity, specifically if you look at lung epicsis cell progenitor cells. Cellular senescence can also result in accumulation of the cells, and we all know we have a lot of fibroblasts, for example, within the lung that we can see. So, again, there might be multiple ways. And it does matter which cell it is, because it tells us something about the pathophysiology. And if we learn more about the pathophysiology, we learn more about ways of how we can hopefully direct and also um, improve future therapeutic approaches. These senescent cells talk all the time. They are very busy talking to everything around them, so this is what we have to understand. What's the language? What are the proteins that we can use for that? And I want to point out that obviously it's very, very specific, and this comes back to the question in terms of, you know, like what are the really the cell and disease-specific effects, the pro versus anti-fibrotic effects, and I think this is, will be something in terms of how we target really senescence as a therapeutic, which the following two talks will talk more about. So I'm very excited to, to hear about this. I can tell you there's a lot of epithelial cell signatures even within the senolytic treatments. So, um, and with this, I actually would like to thank, obviously, everybody always involved in everything that we do all the time. This is my lab. There's a lot of undifferentiated, non-senescent progenitor cells within them, um, and I hope they don't senesce uh, so so quickly, so this is really the basis for everything which we do, and with this I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions now or later on. Thank you.